you have discovered episode 97 of Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash, in which I make a new buddy. And you might be saying to yourself, hold on a minute, Nick. You're an anarchist, and William Gadsden's a minarchist. But just listen to the episode and see. I don't think he's a minarchist. He says he's a minarchist. I'm, I'm not going to get into it. You guys watch, listen to the episode. But before, let me real quick say thank you. A heartfelt Super awesome thank you to my Dank Podstash super supporters, Maxwell, Dave, and Dennis. You guys keep the show on the road. Of course, thank you to my other patrons as well. All of you guys keep this going, and I appreciate it so much. Also, the Dank Podstash is officially sponsored by Project Sparta. Now is the time to get healthy and in shape. Greg Papa Nicholas is going to get you there with personalized meal plans, training, group support, and tons and tons of amazing fitness and motivational resources and knowledge, including the Project Sparta Facebook group. You can go to ProjectSpartaCoaching.com and learn more about Greg's work and get started on your path to health. In this crazy world we're living in, our health is more important than ever. Get up, start learning, communicating, and training. One of the most important and often neglected things in life is your physical health. Get to ProjectSpartaCoaching.com now and get after it. And of course, I got to shout out Voluntary Apothecary. Voluntary Apothecary is here to fulfill all of your beard care needs. They carry beard oil, mustache wax, beard butter, and more. I only use their beard care products and I love them. You can check out their amazing products at VoluntaryApothecary.com. And listeners of the show, you guys, you can take 10% off your order with code DANK at checkout. Also, Voluntary Apothecary is going to be sponsoring a giveaway for episode 100. That's only three episodes away, so keep an ear to the show to figure out what that giveaway is and get that share at hashtag. I'm not sure exactly what yet, but we're going to do something so that you can be chosen to win something awesome from Voluntary Apothecary. One more thing, the, vol- the Dank Podstash is teamed up with Road to Anarchy for a monthly newsletter. Road to Anarchy is an online magazine connecting groups of voluntary individuals who are looking to increase their freedom from the state. Becoming more self-reliant and developing a better focus on becoming a productive individual is the only mission. The only division is against the state. No matter your flavor of anarchy, finding your road to anarchy is the first step to progress. The time is now to put our individual differences aside, join up, and create change. You can go to RoadToAnarchy.com to sign up for the monthly zine or to Patreon.com <clears throat> slash the dank podstash and get signed up with any tier of support. Check out the Road to Anarchy Facebook page and groups to connect with other individuals on the Road to Anarchy. Where is your road taking you? And now we get to probably the greatest conversation ever had between an anarchist and a minarchist. I'm just saying, it's kind of a big deal. Enjoy. <laughs> Enemy of the state. An enemy of the state. Enemy of the state. Dank Podstash. You're listening to Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. Check out thedankpodstash.com to find every episode of the Dank Podstash, links to support the show via our Bitbacker and Patreon, Dank Podstash merchandise, and much more. If you'd like to advertise on the Dank Podstash, Email us at dankpodstash at gmail.com. Welcome back to another episode of Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash. I am joined today by William Gadsden. What's going on, man? How's it going, man? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. We had a little short conversation before about we're gonna what we're gonna talk about, digging the the open vibe that we got, and we have that on Facebook too. Even though our I guess political leanings, I wouldn't say they're opposed, um, but you would say you're a minarchist, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And see, the thing that anarchists hate about minarchists is that you're so fucking close. <laughs> but not quite. And it's like, God damn right. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I absolutely understand the sentiment. Uh, m- many of my fellow minarchists feel the same way about anarchists. So, yeah. you know, it's okay. all right. So what is it from that side then? Like if we, if anarchists are saying minarchists are so close and you get all frustrated because like you still have that little bit of fucking statism. What's the side from minarchist to anarchist mm. then? What are you frustrated with? 
So the main criticism is basically that um, it's, it's sort of a pie in the sky mentality. And, you know, nobody jump on, on me in the comment section just yet. But um, it, it's, I'm being hyperbolic when I say this, but it's not dissimilar from communism in, in the strictest sense. So in, uh, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx writes about um, how, you know, in this, in this ideal uh, communist post-scarcity, post, uh, post post-government world, we will uh, fish in the morning and we'll uh, labor in the fields until the afternoon, and then we will go hunting, and then we'll discuss philosophy and, and read by candlelight at night you know it's this very you know hey that sounds freaking great man i'd love to live that life and and in the same way and this is what i mean just in the same way that that utopian uh, ideal has never been achieved and and i don't think it can be achieved in the same way in a in an ancap society again sounds great dude i would love to see it happen I'd love to live in that world, but I don't think it will ever be accomplished. Hmm. So when ANCAPs, uh, you know, come at somebody like me and like, oh, well, you're just a statist, you're a bootlicker, you're this and that. And I'm just like, no, nah, man, like I, I empathize with, with your viewpoint. I wish it could happen. I just don't think it can. Okay. So I guess that would be the main, the main gripe. Well, the main flaw with what Mark says is that would require communists to work. So that's, that's not going to happen. And, <laughs> uh, second um the other point i'd touch on i'd address is the the utopian ideal because that was something that i um struggled with a lot when i was first like digging into anarchist philosophy and talking to other anarchists and stuff because i felt um anti-government for a long time anti-authority for as long as i can remember but it wasn't until i don't know five ten years ago somewhere in that range that I started actually reading uh, more anarchist literature from across the spectrum and whatnot and seeing quotes from anarchists and realizing there are fucking people out there who have thought about this stuff and talked about it. And the utopian yeah. thing, that's the hardest, that's the hardest sell um, because you, it, you can never have a utopia. You can't have dark without light and blah, 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 all the different fucking shit you can compare it to. Mm. <clears throat> I, I don't like the utopian uh, argument for anarchy because it's unrealistic. Um, then that's what attracted me so much to agorism. Um, and I probably bring it up almost every show because I love uh, the New Libertarian Manifesto that Konkin wrote. And his kind of backwards track from um, a free market society, an anarchist society, stateless society, to statism, he kind of went backwards in time to show you how it progressed. And the state never goes away. Mm -hmm. And there's not one way, there's not one utopia that everyone is, you know, involved in, like you said, reading philosophy by candlelight and fishing and hunting and all that stuff. Um, but there are still pockets of statism and it's not addressed whether or not they're aggressive pockets of statism or in maybe a minarchist, if he's calling minarchist statist pockets of minarchism and pockets of different stuff all over the place. And I think that's a much more realistic way that a much more realistic thing that could be achieved um, would be to carve out your spots of how you want to live. But that also comes back to getting along with people who have different viewpoints or being able to live separately from them. I think that's a much better idea than the utopian and honestly a better sell. I agree. Um, so I've only recently started becoming more familiar with agorism um, I, I love the idea, frankly, you know, to, to be involved in the gray or even the black markets in order to, or a, as a way of undermining state authority. I'm all for it, man. You mm -hmm. know, um, as, as long as it's voluntary transactions, consensual transactions between individuals. I mean, Hey, that's, that's the basis of libertarianism, right? Or at mm -hmm. least one of them. Um, so let me ask you, since I am relatively new to the, to the philosophy, uh, I see it more as a tool to achieve uh, an end goal. So that would be minimizing the state or the power of the state. In your mind, how does that grow from just uh, a tool to be used to a full-on philosophy? Um, so I think the philosophy is the tool. I think you're hundred percent right. It's a, it's a tool. And the part that I like, one of the parts, I don't know, I love all of it. So, but one of my favorite parts is that if, 
you can utilize agorism to achieve a free market, to get to that agora with no, um, you know, constricting regulations, anything like that. We got the free market. Agorism disappears because it's achieved its goal. You've done what you've come to do. You don't have to have black and gray markets anymore because those are created by legality. Yeah. So at that point, if we were, if it was to get to that point and the goal has been achieved, where would you go from there? Uh, philosophically speaking, philosophically, um, I always describe myself as either an agorist or an agorist and a black flag anarchist and not necessarily the way that a lot of more left anarchists describe black flag anarchy, but the idea that there are no um, I don't have any ties to any one thing. I'm, I'm independent. I have my own deal because that's what I'm doing now. I left uh, my home in Arizona with my wife to move up here out way the fuck away from civilization and live as far away from everything and be as independent as possible. And that's what I would like to do. Mm. So, I mean, there's, okay. there's good and bad parts of every philosophy, uh, some more than others. Um, but I mean, at a, if if we were to achieve something like Konkin's description of pockets of statism and whatnot, and then other pockets of anarchy and just mm. pretty much free everywhere, I don't see much need for a whole lot of the philosophies because it seems like most of them are just advocating mm. until they get to the point of, of freedom, like agorism. Um, but the moral code, I guess. Mm is what I would still hang on to. And I, it's just, I mean, it kind of can line up with the, with the nap or whatever. I just, it's pretty much, um, leave me the fuck alone and I'll leave you the fuck alone. And then also the foundations right. of agorism, voluntary, peaceful interactions if, and, uh, whenever possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense to me, man. Um, so I, I guess that would be a good segue into what we were discussing earlier. Do you think if we could get to that point, do you think it's sustainable? I mean, so this is where we, of course, we have to talk about uh, human nature itself. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you hold those morals, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we both know a lot of people that also hold those morals. Is that something that can be achieved and maintained? So this kind of dovetails perfectly into what we were going to talk about with hunter gatherers and the for the um, mm -hmm. origins of government and how they ran their societies. Um, and it can be absolutely, but it not it not only takes vigilance um, and defense, but a shift in culture. And you know, politics are always downstream yeah. of culture, anyways. And uh, I found a really good article. Uh, for our hunter gatherer conversation whenever we get to it it's by uh, peter gray phd and it's ca called how hunter gatherers maintain their egalitarian ways and there's three theories across the board um and he specializes in teaching how hunter gatherers taught uh, their children and um in society and whatnot let me see here okay so the first theory and this is as far as cult cultural change to be able to maintain uh that post-state society is a system of reverse dominance that they practice, that hunter-gatherers practice, that prevented anyone from assuming power over others. So they didn't they didn't take kindly to pride and putting on airs and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of the, they, pretty much reading through it, it's a lot of the things you see in politicians now, they did not, uh, they didn't take that. They wouldn't allow people to hold those, um, I guess those feelings over other people or those actions over other people. They're like, at one specific example, I can't remember, it might have been Dr. Christopher Ryan, either on his podcast or on Joe Rogan's podcast, was talking about a hunter-gatherer tribe that he had visited that whenever, if a hunter got a really good kill, uh, something awesome to bring back to their tribe, uh, they would get made fun of and ridiculed so they didn't get a big head. Really? Yeah, and that's common. Wow. That's common with a lot of stuff. And I don't know if it needs to be that extreme because we're kind of we're obviously mm -hmm. very far past hunter gatherers in a lot of ways, but I think in our in our genetic makeup we still have those memories, I guess. And I think that's pretty mm -hmm. evident when you look at how people handle social me social media and that kind of stuff. So I think there's a middle ground. 
So that's one way yeah. is, is is inserting that and practicing that as a culture. And then the second theory he has here, and these these theories that he put together in this article are from a large sample of other researchers who study hunter-gatherers and have from ancient hunter-gatherers to now. And he says this seems to be the general uh, top three theories that are accepted that seem likely. So the second one is hunter-gatherers maintained equality by nurturing the playful side of their human nature and uh, seeing that play promotes equality. <clears throat> and that's really interesting because that goes into how they raised their children because it wasn't um, necessarily the nuclear family, obviously. They didn't really have the nuclear family then. I don't think there's anything wrong with a nuclear family, but no man, no family is an island either. I like the idea of communities uh, working together for education, all that stuff. Sure. But with hunter-gatherer children, in general, they played to learn, and they didn't really take part in a lot of the work. That was the that was for the adults, and it was dawn-to-dusk play, and that went into um, their adulthood. Uh, a lot of them, of course, had trials uh, for coming of age and whatnot, but uh, a lot of groups would go out and it's like a, it's a playful, it's like a, a guy trip, a guy fucking camping trip when they go out and fucking hunt and they bring something back to the mm -hmm. village. And there's really interesting and kind of hilarious stories. Some of the, some of the <laughs> village women would, uh, wake up before the guys did on the day of their hunt and they go whisper to him, Hey, if you get a fucking deer or something, I'll definitely have sex with you when you get back. And so they would spread that out. <laughs> they would spread that out. The guys when they're uh, hunting would spread that out by whoever took down whatever game, if it was one or multiple, they would uh, butcher it and they would all bring some back so everybody could get laid. So <laughs> spread it nice. out. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very <laughs> interesting. Um, I, and of course, I still need to connect all this into modern society, but it's something I've been thinking about for a while. I got so many fucking thoughts I'm trying to connect from, you know, the <laughs> from hunter gatherer stuff and all that into now on top of things that are sure. more uh topical now i'm trying to find the fucking third all right the third one the third theory here hunter gatherers maintain their ethos of equality through their child rearing practices which engendered feelings of trust and acceptance in each new generation and that sounds um like a whole lot more of i guess free learning like uh, following your kids mm -hmm. interests and that kind of stuff and guiding them on that rather than forcing mm -hmm. them down a certain curriculum and so on and so forth. I could go on for a while about this. But those would be my – I like those ideas along with I'm sure many others that I could think of at some point um, of how to keep that society. I also – I've been big into the mm -hmm. Boogaloo stuff, that kind of thing, and I think sometimes you need to fuck shit up. I think that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think – Historically, it's not even necessarily that we need a reset or we want a reset or whatever. I think it's it just happens. It's inevitable mm -hmm. to a certain extent. So when it does happen, what do you do to rebuild um, what you lost? And, and what do you do to uh, reconstruct things in such a way that the previous mistakes don't happen again? So that's a big on one. that point, that's when we really have to Oh gosh, yeah. Well, and and especially during the Enlightenment period, there were so many different views on exactly how that should go. You know, so you've got um, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke that uh, took a, a far more uh, individual or, or uh, roughly libertarian, more on on the John sure. Locke side uh, view of things, and you know, em empowered the individual and this sort of thing. And then you have folks like Edmund Burke who says. No, like, don't mess with anything. We just need to maintain the status quo. Uh, and then, of course, you've got Rousseau, who went the complete opposite direction and said, no, you have to, if you're going to reset, you tear everything down. Mm. And you start over from the bare minimum. Um, so I, I, I think history is, is literally just a list of major changes, mm. right? So to tie it back into what you're saying before, 100% agree with you on the, the idea that it's cultural. Mm. Um, I could not agree more. Uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Thomas Sowell writes pretty extensively about, in, um, specifically in Black, Red, Next, White Liberals, mm. one of my favorite books on society and culture. Um, but it also ties into, and Dr. Sowell also references 
F.A. Hayek quite a bit. So in F.A. Hayek's book, The Fatal Conceit, uh, he, he breaks down the, the development of society and of culture into essentially a survival of the fittest sort of mode. Mm. So as times change, as technology changes, um, society and human behavior, well, I should say human behavior, and as a result, society changes with it. So like what you were saying with, uh, well, the, the apportionment of, of the meat when the hunters come back mm -hmm. and this sort of thing, you know, maybe they'll be made fun of or whatever. I, I think, I don't know that we can achieve that anymore right. because as we become more global, we have, oh, I mean, the internet, of course, just set off a bomb uh, and, and reset everything that we knew about um, human development and and in a lot of ways the internet itself has created a microscope mm -hmm. on uh human behavior mm -hmm. i mean look at the comments section on literally any youtube video <laughs> and you see you see you know human nature in its rawest form oh Jesus. um so oh yeah i know it's well in, in facebook too or yeah. or twitter or dumpster whatever fires. it's all just a, an absolute dumpster fire <laughs> yes thank you exactly um so I don't know that we can ever go back to something like that because now human psyche has evolved along with technology, along with society and culture to the point where now, like, no, we expect praise when we do good things. Right. And that's a double-edged sword. I mean, we, we, I think we can both agree that meritocracy is a wonderful thing mm -hmm. and is, is one of the main propellants for society and culture as a whole. Uh, of course, on the flip side of that, then you've got, people like uh, Nicki Minaj or Cardi B, they're getting praises for what they're doing, you know? And I'm kind of like, ah, you know, I don't know about all that, but yeah. to, to each their own. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely a double-edged sword, man. Um, I think we would have to go back to a, an enlightenment era type discussion on where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. So with, with something like, uh, the these riots that are going on these you know the mostly peaceful protests and everything else i whether they know it or not and this is something i've written a couple of articles about they are absolutely adhering to rousseauian philosophy hmm. they're they we need to burn it all down right. it's not just about the Confe confederate monuments hey that elk statue we got to destroy that too why i don't know everybody's just doing it you know yeah um mob mentality so oh gosh and, and it's it's horrifying and and i think uh, people aren't taking it nearly as seriously as they should because there's a natural progression at play here that we've mm. already seen. Um, uh, you know, and so, some people, I got a couple of comments saying, well, that's the slip, slippery slope fallacy. Well, it's not a fallacy if it's happening before our very sure. eyes, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, let me real quick jump in. Uh, you're, you're asking, how do yeah. we go from here? And the, the, the hitch I have with that question or how do we get to that it's the we it's it's i think looking at it as a global right. we is too much um i don't think there is a we I there agree. is a global we other than us as humans in general um because i don't think that it's going to be it it just smacks of utopianism like we were talking about before i think the idea of mm -hmm. if this hunter gatherer thing that i uh, this article that, that I referenced earlier, those are theories appeal to you. You and your people can give that a shot and so on and so forth and, right. into different pockets of other stuff. I think that decentralization rather than a global we is probably the best route to achieve. And that's another thing, not a global goal, but uh, a lot of different goals. And it's about getting... Sure. The monopoly on violence and the power away from the people who are abusing it, obviously. I think that's an important distinction mm -hmm. to make. Oh, sure. that was the other thing, too. Um, it You mentioned, um, I think you mentioned, were the different cycles repeating. I just dove deep into Dan Carlin's mm. hardcore history and bought all of his stuff so I could listen to it. And yes. it was at it's just like synchronicity because I was just thinking, for fuck's sake, we're in this repeating cycle over and over and over. And it's the strong men create good times yeah. and so on. I can't remember what that's called, that, right. that quote, but over and over and over. And then I kind of stepped back uh, while well, I was listening to the Wrath of the Cons. And 
um, mm. the Persian and Sumerian stuff that he goes into. And it, it seems like mm. these cycles are happening and repeating from the beginning of our historical records that we have. And it could have been more than that. And that's why I'm so fascinated with hunter gatherer uh, style living and societies and whatnot, because the records of uh, government or whatever you want to call uh, Genghis Khan and his conquering and stuff before he have, you know, formed different governments and trade routes and stuff that happens over and over and over in history when there weren't these massive empires or um, like Dan Carlin says, a new way of fighting or weapon that just completely revolutionizes everything, which is how Genghis Khan was able to take everything over. It was with those horse bowmen. Um, it seems like for hundreds of thousands of years, it was kind of not necessarily a cycle uh, and more just like this is how it is. This is how people are living because hunter gatherers and those societies have lived forever for a really long time and there wasn't it didn't seem to be a, a repeating cycle but we could be missing whatever cycles were repeating because there aren't a lot of history from uh, histories uh, written down or passed down orally whatever from them um it, and now i don't know how how into uh like the ideas of ancient advanced societies like graham hancock and those guys talk about um, you are, but it, this could have, it could have happened. I, for... I, I love, I love Graham Hancock. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, and okay, then we could have had a different history. Uh, what was it? 10, 15,000 years ago before the comet struck and melted the glaciers and whatnot that repeated over and over. And before that hunter gathers and stuff. But I think the problem, the hitch that, that keeps catching and starting the cycle over is once again, that, that centralization that centralization of power and stuff mm. like that. And with what you were saying now that with the internet being a microscope on all of this, um, I don't think, I mean, if it was a hard reset, if that's what we were going to have, it would have to be blowing us back to the stone age to try again. I don't think right. there's a hard enough right. reset uh, other than that. Um, so we need to develop the next uh, Genghis Khan warfare tactics the next uh, amazing thing that just blows everything else out of the water otherwise i think it's just going to keep going on soft resets and so on and that's a big fucking question that i have no fucking idea how to answer but i think about it all day well so the and i guess this is where we we would run into our first disagreement mm -hmm. here is that i don't know i i think human nature itself is is going to continue this cycle uh, inevitably, inexorably. I, I don't know that there's any way to really stop it. So, for example, when you when you talk about weapons, um, you know the the compound bow and the horse. You know that was like shock and awe. You know of of the ancient world, uh, the tactics they used and everything else. So you see the same thing with uh, in World War One when when we entered this phase of what some historians call industrialized warfare. Mm -hmm. You know, machine guns. Uh, poison gas, you know, uh, uh, trench warfare, and and just all all of the horrors that came along with that giant uh, artillery pieces and everything else. Everyone shifted into a new phase of warfare, and so in, in those two occasions, of course, when the atomic bomb and nuclear weapons were developed, it seems like humanity, everybody kind of stops and goes, "What? Mm -hmm. Like what? What is that? What is this?" And then everybody rushes to to figure out a way to adapt to it. So now we, we've entered this phase, especially with mutually assured destruction and things like that, where everyone's going, hey, we all agree, uh, war is bad, but that's not going to stop us from doing right. it, you know, because again, human nature leads us to, to this inevitability. So now we're entering a phase, uh, I, I think it's fifth generation warfare now, where it's, it's based around uh, insurgencies, wars of attrition, but it's much more heavy on information warfare and cyber warfare but it's no less dangerous. It's no less deadly. Sure. It's, it's in fact, because it's more uh, shadowy, it's that much more dangerous. So I think that's where we're entering a phase now where everyone's, we're getting to that point where everyone's going to stop and go, whoa, like, what was that? Um, it could be hackers shutting down the electrical grid. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, people funding, funding a, a, not necessarily violent in the sense of open warfare, but 
violent enough groups like uh, the some of these uh, organized rioting groups like a group like Antifa, uh, more extreme elements. So instead of somebody sending invasion ships and, and marching troops onto our soil, they just they just have us do it to ourselves on the inside. Sure. And sure. that is no less a form of warfare than uh, than the previous one. So, I mean, yeah, like I said, man, I I, I think it's something that we're just endlessly going to run into. And, and I know that's depressing and, and that's something I wrestled with for a long time, but it's just kind of like, man, we, we got to stave it off for as long as we can, but always be prepared for when it rears its ugly head again. Right. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. Um, that's the way I've been leaning. I don't, like I said, I don't think there's a hard enough reset that we aren't going to face it endlessly. Um, mm. The, the, mm. I guess, answer to that, <clears throat> for myself and a lot of people I know is s- trying to step outside and defend your little slice of heaven, um, trying to step away from that in, right. in one way or another. And I think you'll probably have um, a good perspective on the idea of secession because you're more into government avenues yeah. as a minarchist. I think secession is a possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and the one of the hard questions I have as an anarchist is how to secede without utilizing state channels um and that that brings you some some (laughs) some bullets flying that could bring make the bullets fly if you're going to try to step outside without using the correct channels i think with the way things are going in the u.s now um yeah i don't know if it's inevitable but i think there could be a tilt towards another civil war not necessarily north versus south or something Mm -hmm. like that but a massive push for right. ending federal power and bringing back state power. And I think mm-hmm. that opportunity, that would be an opportunity mm-hmm. for anarchists, minarchists, libertarians, whatever, to maybe carve out a slice and say, Hey, I want to live in the state. I don't want to fuck with all of your uh, forced things, but I'm willing to maybe subscribe mm-hmm. to pay tolls on the roads I drive on, whatever this, the vol the st- I will voluntarily pay for the things that I use, but I won't be forced to pay for it. I think that would be a massive, sure. awesome opportunity. Um, what do you think about that? What do you think as far as secession and maybe a, a civil war coming up? What are you seeing? So I, I, I see both of those things. I, uh, total agreement with you on this. So, uh, there's a great book called American secession. Mm-hmm. I can't recall the author's name off the top of my head. But uh, he's the, I want to say he's a, a legal uh, and history professor. Right. Um, but he wrote this great book, American Secession. And uh, he, he goes through, opens it with, these are, this is what a secessionist movement is. This is what it looks like. Let's look at some of the historical examples of secessionist movements, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Uh, how did all of these turn out? And then the meat of the book is going through statistics, going through polls, going through everything else, uh, making the case that we are closer to a secessionist movement than we ever have Mm. before uh, in the US, uh, obviously since the Civil War. Um, And so he outlines uh, the movement in in the Pacific Northwest, uh, I think they call it Cascadia, Mm -hmm. um, the the split uh, Cal exit movement, uh, Texas uh, Texas exit movement, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and how we're kind of in a perfect storm right now politically, where these we, we've got two sides that can't coexist with one another anymore. The polarization is too great, and now, unlike the first American Civil War, this is more likely to be peaceful, hmm. where everybody, you know, let's say California or the Pacific Northwest says, "Hey guys, we're out," and everybody else is like, "Good luck to you," you know, kind of <laughs> yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, I, I would totally be on board with that, to be, mm-hmm. to be frank with you. Um, what I'm concerned about, and this is where it shifts into more of the Civil War idea, is that uh, violence is already taking place in, in the larger, more left cities, Portland, L.A., New York. Um, I, I live in the South. I've lived in the South my whole life. Um, well, that's not true. I was in the military for a while, so they, they moved me around quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But Besides uh, that time I spent in the military, I've, I've always been in the South. Um, and the I don't see the culture facilitating the kind of violence that we see in these other cities, these, these other parts of the country. Sure. But 
I think balkanization is the only way forward uh, for the country if we are to maintain peace and and have some semblance of an organized uh, uh, movement, secessionist movement. So the way I see this playing out is in, in public policy, there's a concept uh, based around political culture. So for example, in the Northeast, and they can trace this back roughly to how it was founded. So in the Northeast, obviously they're a lot more tolerant of um, authority, of, mm -hmm. of governmental authority. And the idea is that, well, we give you this so we can get that. Right. And, and they're a lot more okay with that. Uh, and the theory is that that is largely because they were primarily founded by Puritans and Quakers and this sort of thing. Very, very rigid, stoic, right. you know, um, hardworking people, but they're okay with this more communal sense. Um, you know, the, uh, the authority back then was God. Um, now it's the state. Uh, in the South, mostly, uh, or well, not mostly, but heavily uh, settled by Irish and Scots who are historically not too great with authority. Yep, you know, they, they fought the English <laughs> crown for, for forever. Um, and so there, that cements a political culture that does not tolerate authority. They want to be left alone, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. So there are five different distinct political cultures throughout the U.S. Uh, I wrote an article about this on Think Liberty. Uh, I'm not hopeful that it'll, it'll happen, but I would love to see those five, and they're ge geographically um, separated as well. So these distinct cultures are in uh, their own areas, parts of the country. So I would like to see the country kind of split their separate ways into these five political, uh, political culture-based geographical locations. That, mm. was, that was a messy word salad, but I think you get where I'm going <laughs> yeah, with yeah. it. Um, so I, I would like to see that, that happen if a breakup is inevitable. And I think at this point, we're damned close. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, it's like, hey, man, we're, we're going to split up into these five areas. If you are someone that is more aligned with, say, the Pacific Northwest's political culture, but you live in Tennessee, you've got a year or five years or however long, this is your timeline to move. Mm -hmm. And if you don't in that time period, hey, man, this is what you're going to get. So you need to suck it up. Right. Um, and I, I think that would that would go back to uh, at least the idea of the Articles of Confederation. So every state, I think um, Justice Rehnquist of the Supreme Court uh, was the one that, that uh, talked about each state being a laboratory for democracy. Mm. And that was the original intent of the Articles of Confederation. Each, each state will do what it pleases, run itself, manage itself how it pleases. Uh, and if, if they screw something up, that's on them. And if they do something really well, that's on them too. And so everybody can then vote with their feet, as it were, and say, I agree with, with this culture. I like what they're doing. I'm going to move there. But of course, the federal government had to come in and screw all of that up. Right. Um, anyway, that's what I would like to see. I don't see it happening because there are too many people. First of all, the elites that are in positions of power and their only interest is maintaining the status quo. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second part is that we have a lot of people, including myself until recently, that, you know, we see the American flag, we, we understand what that stands for, and we have this, this, these sort of rose-colored glasses, this idea about what it was before, and thinking that it still is, right. but it's not anymore no. in, in so many different ways. But I think people are too quick to cling to that ideal. And they don't want to see that kind of change happen. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I don't think it will happen without, uh, I mean, extreme violence and frankly, bloodshed. Yeah, absolutely. That I like that a lot because I've been rolling the idea of the different um, <clears throat> forms secession may take. And I've been thinking more along the lines of the different states and maybe some split states like the Cascadia and whatnot. I even saw one because I'm in the inland northwest. I'm, I'm across the Cascades to the east from fucking seattle and all that shit i don't i like it over here it it feels more libertarian um than anything despite most people i think identifying as republican when it comes down to it and talking to them they're very leave me the fuck alone i don't like government but i saw a right. map drawn out of what they wanted to make uh, greater idaho which was eastern washington and oregon yes. and northern idaho and i 
do not fucking like that at all. <laughs> I don't like Northern Idaho's yeah, politics. Yeah, it, it, it's a little wonky. <laughs> yeah, it's wonky. There's mm-hmm. there's too much um, there's too much elevation change on the level of uh, conservative there. There's some very extreme mm-hmm. conservatives and some less so and more libertarian. And I don't think that'd be a good mix. But I like your idea of the five different cultural uh, political zones much more than the 50 different uh, political outlined zones that we call states. Right. Um, that is, right. I like that a lot. And I actually saw someone made a map of that. I, it may have come, did, was there a map included on your article about that? Um, I don't think so, but I th- I'm pretty sure I know what you're talking about. It had like an uh, and, anarchist and that is, zone. That is and... exactly what, what I thought about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That was interesting. Yeah, there's, there's like an autonomous zone and, yeah, mm-hmm. that would be really cool. That'd be, yeah, because that's, like we said, you know, the the culture that's upstream from politics. And it gives people a lot more room, because mm-hmm. um, that's one thing, you know, <laughs> anarchists, libertarians, whatever, getting them all together is like herding cats, and no one wants to live in the same fucking place because everyone has their different preferences for climate and all that kind of stuff. So if you open it up to zones versus state, that'd be actually really excellent. And people could disappear in big zones if they wanted to up into the hills or whatnot. And it'd be it'd be good. Um, Sure. It's interesting, too, that I think the the blue cities, because I don't want to say blue states because I refuse to recognize Mm -hmm. uh, Washington or even Oregon and many others as blue states because it's just those fucking city centers that are blue Mm -hmm. surrounded by red. And even right. some yellow zones. Um, it's that I, if they they're going to everybody that has talked about these state splits and whatnot knows that they're fucked if they want to cut off the agriculture from their areas. <laughs> they right. may have money, but you can't eat. Exactly. That. So uh, they're going to they're right. going to fuck this up more than anybody else. I think if it, if it starts coming to fruition. Well, I'll tell you what, man, Um we, we, we're seeing, whether we like it or not, or whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're seeing a massive drain uh, or depopulation of some of the, the biggest cities in the country right mm-hmm. now. More and more people are starting to talk about it and to write articles about it. But this is something I saw coming, I mean, I- at least when COVID hit. Mm. Uh, so if you're familiar with Tim Pool, he's been doing a lot of coverage on this. Um, you know, COVID hit, all of the rich New Yorkers left the city and and just you know went to their homes in, in the hamptons or whatever you know because they can afford to do that they can mm-hmm. ride it out and then once these riots started they're like i'm not coming back yeah <laughs> you know we've got we've got all these major corporations leaving california and moving to texas or um i think magpul there's a major arms company that was in colorado that left and i think went to texas yep. uh, my home state of tennessee there were a lot of businesses beretta uh vw a few others that moved uh, major factories and manufacturing centers from the Northeast to Tennessee because of the, the lighter regulation. I mean, it's, it should be so obvious what's happening with, especially to these politicians and they're going, oh shit, we're gonna lose our tax revenue yep. base. Like all the rich people are leaving. What, are, what the hell are we gonna do? Um, so I know this sounds kind of messed up, but I'm actually very excited to see this mass uh, exodus from the major cities because we know how this is going to affect uh, voting. You know, mm-hmm. these these blue uh, voters are going to move into more rural, very red areas and just disappear. I mean, they will no longer be uh, politically empowered, uh, if that makes sense, at least mm-hmm. a- as an individual. They won't have that same kind of centralized voter base that they had before. Um, and that's that's going to radically change things if we don't get into another civil war. Um, well, yeah, and you see people bitching about all these people moving out of those areas into the more rural areas and bringing their politics with them. Uh, so hopefully it can be diluted enough. Because, yeah. like I said before, I'm out way in the fucking woods, so I have to have satellite internet, and I cannot fucking stand, mm. like, just down the hill from me, some fucking yuppies from California are building a big-ass fucking thing on the lake and it's just like god damn it man why why do you got to choose here Mm -hmm. i don't like that shit but that's just that's just an aside um but yeah that'd be interesting because if you got you know i guess a 
a portion of the Democrats, liberals, whatever you want to call them, moving into the much more conservative areas, that might be a, a, Mm. I guess, a tilt towards the middle for libertarianism. Might be some concessions made on on both sides, but who knows? Um, Yeah, it does. It's it doesn't feel good seeing it happen when you're in those areas necessarily. And I think everybody that Mm. wants to leave a big city to go into rural areas, a lot of them don't know what they're getting into. I didn't grow up in a big city. Right. I grew up in Tucson, it was smaller, and I worked in very rural areas for most of my life in mining and stuff like that. <clears throat> so I get the mm. culture more than people, I think, who have lived in the large cities their whole lives and want to leave. And I actually bought a book by Ragnar Benson. I cannot remember the fucking name, but it's about um, acclimating to country society, country life. And not pissing off your neighbors when you go out there being a dick and bringing a lot of stuff in with for, with you from the cities because you really you're going to make some problems right. and things are handled differently right. when you're really far out and you're going to alienate people that you need to rely on when you maybe can't see your neighbor over because your acreage is separating you or everybody's on right. 10 acre plots. If there's an emergency, they're going to come to your aid before anybody else. Uh, my landlord rolled a tractor on right. himself up here, and I was there pulling him out from under Jeez. him before for, uh, I think it took an hour for an ambulance and stuff to get out. Luckily, he was okay. That's the kind of thing that you don't want to be the piece of shit from the city when something like that happens to you. Right. You want people to come by. I mean, there's, I think, a 40-minute response time for the nearest cop out here, and I like it that way. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff right. you got to take care of yourself. Um there was a case uh, somewhere in rural Oregon where people moved next to a couple of sheep farms and the sheep farms had working dogs and they bark a lot and they herd the sheep and the pe- the city people that moved out there fucking hated it and uh, tried to take them to court over and over again, long drawn out, lots of money and ended up fucking winning. Mm-hmm. And all these working dogs were forcefully debarked. They had to be debarked. Um, ruled by whatever judge was on what that. The- and and it's like they can't do their jobs now. That's a torturous thing to put an animal through. Right. And now that those fucking people from the city are just the pariah of that area. But they don't give a fuck because they had money yeah, and they could win it. Yeah, of course. And it's just terrible. That's the shit I don't want to see happen. And then that's also when you start seeing terrible things happen to those people who are surrounded by people they victimized by the state. Right. Yeah. What, what do you what do you think is going to happen at yeah. that point? You know, um, so that's that's a really interesting point. Um, I was uh, I troll Reddit as well as Facebook. <laughs> um, and uh, I was I was kind of went on a bit of a rant. Uh, basically, I'll, I'll drop a comment about, you know, taxation is extortion or whatever. And Reddit is just notoriously leftist. Yeah. So somebody will get in there and like, oh, well, you're one of these blah, blah, blah. Yeah, whatever, dude. So I started explaining and used as an example, like when you're out in the country and somebody breaks into your home, uh, you, you have like an hour response time from, from the police. And there's, we were probably talking about guns as well. Now that I think about it, hmm. um, what, what are you going to do? And then more to the point, you're already paying taxes in order to ostensibly receive this service of public safety, of protection by way of the police. But if they're going to take an hour to show up, well, they're, they're going to be canvassing a body and mm-hmm. it's going to be yours or the person that broke into your house, you know, and all of these people were like, no way. There's no place in the country that a police take an hour there. to get there. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You know? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was stationed in um, Southern Idaho for about three years and, and we had a local uh, law enforcement officer kind of came and give a briefing to everybody that was just moving there and said, Hey, look, man, if somebody breaks into your home, uh, this is unofficial, but you make sure you kill them. Yeah. Like you don't shoot them and then wound them. You go ahead and kill them because first of all, it's going to take us forever to get out there. It's going to take forever for an ambulance to get out there. And if, if you do just wound them, they're going to take you to court. Yep. You know? Uh, so, so let's not, let's not push that along. Just get it over with, man. Mm -hmm. Um, but all these people on Reddit are so out of touch and so clueless. They have no idea that I would say the majority of America lives in places that are similar, similar to that. Maybe not an hour response time, mm-hmm. maybe 30 minutes, whatever. 
But so this is another interesting point, right? So I, I think it was Bernie Sanders, credit where credit is due. Uh, in the 2016 cycle, he talked about how uh, there's a huge difference in how cities uh, should be managed and how uh, rural areas should be mm. managed. And it got me to thinking like, you know, okay, so even Bernie Sanders recognizes that. And this is before he bent the knee and became a total cuck. But um, even he recognizes that there is a distinct difference between uh, population areas and rural areas. So cities and rural areas. And is there something that can be done that can create a dividing line as far as how the state is run just based on the population centers? Uh, France, France is actually a perfect example of this. So the Yellow Vest movement, um, I, I, I hope I can dig it up again and post it now that I'm thinking about it, but there's this long manifesto mm -hmm. from one of the Yellow Vest, the original Yellow Vest uh, um, protesters. And he was basically saying, well, how did all of this come to pass? So what happened was all of these population centers, Bordeaux, uh, 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 Paris, of course, you know, all of these big city, city centers, the country of France is split up into regions, mm -hmm. so similar to our states. So they decide how they're going to run things. And all of these uh, regions decided that we're going to increase taxes on gas because, uh, you know, the environment and this and that. that so all of these the farmers. Population. And, yep. Yeah. And, and, and so the, the argument from these city folks was, was that, well, yeah, can't they just ride their bike? Can't they just take <laughs> wow. public transportation? Yeah. No, dude, they can't, you know? And then so all of these rural people were like, you're fucking us. Mm -hmm. And then they moved into those same population centers and started protesting. And of course, some of that got violent and everything else. And it was all downhill from there. But, but that's the big thing, man. So I would love to figure out, and I don't know what the answer to this is. I would love to figure out a way to uh, have those population centers manage themselves and conduct themselves in whatever the way they see fit without screwing over the rural population mm. and then the rural population can do the same but we can't do that in the current uh governmental system of you know well we've got state and local but when your population centers are running the state do rural areas really have the same level of representation i would argue that they don't yeah no way so that's another thing like how do we handle this yeah you know? i mean ideally it would come back to voluntary interaction and decentralization but i could see a form if you could sell it right i could see it happening where um if you're in a rural area um, i'm just thinking the valley i live in there's like i don't know five or six houses on a hundreds of acres out here uh you just kind of oh beautiful if if you could if the government could just back off and be like, you guys handle yourself for a while, and if you need anything, let's parlay. Let's see what you mm -hmm. need outside sources to handle. Because I enjoy the fact that mm -hmm. there's a school bus route out here, and therefore the roads get plowed. Mm -hmm. um, and they also grade the roads. But in the next little valley over, they plow and grade their own roads, and they all just chip in to pay for maintenance and diesel on the machine that kind of stuff. And that's, I've lived in a lot of places like that. And I like that a lot. So there's one thing to eliminate tax burdens for. Um, I don't know. You could just go on from there. If you need something, let's make a deal sure. on how we're going to work for it and so on and so forth. But it's, it's that hard sell, um, getting the government to right. back off and listen rather than say, we know what the fuck is good for you. So God damn it, pay for it. <laughs> like, why am I paying for right. cops? I've never had a cop out here. I wouldn't anyways, the in I'm sure in every rural area, the mm. shoot, shovel, shut the fuck up is the ethos that's <laughs> everyone holds on to. Mm. Um, and but you mm. can't even do that because if it's an intruder, the monopoly on violence that the state has, you're fucked if they find that body in your yard or animal, whatever. If because I know a lot of people shoot wolves right. if they're coming after their livestock and whatnot, anything like that. I mean, you're fucked if you shoot a bear. Or even maybe uh, I've heard of people getting fucked over, getting into car accidents, hitting a bear. Um, there's all kinds of different shit. If Jeez. they put it out of their, uh, put it out of its misery, that kind of stuff. People go to jail when they're attacked by bears yeah. and they kill them. All kinds of shit. Um, and that's just that overreach. <laughs> that's totally that's the insane. It is. It is. It's like fuck. You know, you should just die. 
and let that bear fucking eat you, it's better than shooting it and going to jail for however long and paying fines. It's ridiculous. It's just crazy. Um, there was one thing well, so, that... So this is kind yeah, of a... Go ahead. Mm, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to jump back, but go ahead. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, well, I don't want to change the subject too much, but mm. but on that same note, with how do we how do we address this overreach and everything else this is kind of the the paradoxical um thing the, the paradoxical paradoxical issue that i wrestle with is so I, I i believe that government is inevitable um and i believe that once government is is produced once it's evolved its only goal is going to be to grow Right. So uh, there, there's there's a I think it's a French political cartoon where there's a lady and holding like a T-Rex on a leash and, you know, and it gets bigger and bigger and then it goes and eats other people. Yeah, and she's yeah. like, it, you know, it's cool, whatever. Uh, and then it turns around and eats her. So yeah. I think the, 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 the paradox is that we I accept that government is inevitable and it does ha- have to exist. But at the same time, we have to constantly fight it to keep it as small as possible knowing that at some point we're going to lapse, we're going to become complacent and it's going to get out of hand again. Mm. So that, that's when you get back into this idea of a cycle, you know, it's like we, government gets too big. We try to reform it. Maybe it gets a little bit smaller. It's going to get big again. And then eventually you get to a place where we need, we need a reset of some kind. Um, and then of course an argument can be had about the, the intensity of that reset. But um, I think it was Thomas Jefferson. This may be a spurious quote, but he says um, the 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 cost of freedom is eternal vigilance. Mm-hmm. So I would argue that eternal vigilance is from us to the state. So we say, hey, listen, you know, we get that. Maybe we need law enforcement. Maybe we need we need roads, right? Mo roads. I get it. Um, <laughs> but how do we how how can we address that in such a manner that the government is still kept at the smallest level possible? So you were saying. Uh, you know, you've got, you like that your road is plowed, that it's maintained, um, but you don't, but you don't need cops. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, I saw this, uh, I think it was a Reddit thread um, that basically said, well, you know, if you don't want cops, then, then just say so, and we won't help you. And, and while we're at it, we won't provide, the state won't provide this, 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 and this. And then somebody responded, responded with the nordic uh you know the nordic yep. chad and it just says yes yeah. you know and i'm like yeah i'm good with that man yeah you know exactly. can, can we itemize these things don't threaten um, me with a good time i don't have yeah exactly like oh say less dude um like i don't have kids but i pay for pl- public exactly I fucking you know? hate that what if it could we get to a point oh and property taxes man that mm. shit drives me bonkers makes me angrier than about anything else other than social security but that's another conversation (laughs) so i don't have kids is there a way that we can itemize these things so that when i do have kids hey man now i'll pay direct you know if i chose to take them to public school and me and my wife have already decided that's not going to be a thing but if we made that choice then we pay for it Mm -hmm. if we need the police and we don't have you know police insurance if you will Mm. you know we're not paying it here and there then hey if we need them to show up maybe we just have to pay off the nose that once yeah but at least we're not having it siphoned from us forcefully you know and that's that's tough man well see that's almost ancapistan and that's that's the right that's the hard part is how do we get there and what you said about government growing and the cycles continuing over and over, its goal is to grow, kind of perfectly dovetails in what I wanted to ju- jump back to. So first, how, yeah. how, do, how do we get there? Um, that's like what I was saying. You pick what you want and you pay for it, whether it's a government or it's a bunch of different privatized things that uh, you're paying into. Great. How do we get there? Um, at this point... I mean, we kind of went over that with the secession and stuff and a short answer bullets. I think that's what it's going to be at some point. Um, Right. And as far as and that kind of goes into government's goal of growing. If you look at governments that grow very large, uh, the one that pops to mind, I think, is the Soviet Union and how insanely prevalent and huge the black and gray market was there that was undermining it. It's because it's so huge that T-Rex gets so big that the people become like ants to it. You can't see everything they're fucking doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that 
it mm-hmm. creates natural decentralization under this bubble and eventually it collapses because it's being undermined. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> that's why I almost I like almost welcome the idea of a global government because it's like, fine, you won't be you'll be able to see me even less, you know, focus on something right. else because you're not going to be able to see me. Um, and that right. I think maybe the Genghis Khan uh, warfare advancement, the new technological advancement, whatever it is that pushes things over the edge would be expanding into space. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been, I have referenced okay. sci-fi and like fantasy, a lot of fiction, a lot because I, I really, I love all that stuff. And I think the authors have been through some shit in their lives to be able to write really, really good stories with really deep messages. And people always give you shit mm. when you reference fiction but it's like there's there's some philosophy here that we can we can look at. Yeah. And if you look at Firefly and the Expanse, there's so much space, mm-hmm. there's so much opportunity to get out there and carve out your area. Or in the in the um, in the Expanse, there's you know the Mars government, Earth government, and then the Outer Planets Alliance, the people who are kind of in between. There's so much fucking room. There's so many different mm-hmm. moons, asteroids, whatever. Um, that might be the next mm-hmm. step. It seems far fetched, but does it? Like, look at look at SpaceX. Look at um, I mean, fuck. Years ago, they had I can't remember the name of the propulsion machine. Well, I guess it wasn't even propulsion, but the idea of folding space to make travel more quickly mm. and generating that power through mm. uh, whatever they were going to do. That stuff's coming, and a lot of it did come from sci-fi too, by the way. So it's not all bullshit. It came from yeah. ideas in sci-fi. But I think that might be that, like you said, that step back, like, whoa, what the fuck is happening moment. And that could, yeah, that could end up very good, very bad. But I think it will end up um, kind of evening out too good with more expansion and area to be out from under that all seeing eye, I guess. That's yeah, that's a great point, man. I've honestly never thought about it that way. Uh, it's it's funny you mention it because I've I've been just binging on sci-fi series nice. for the last few months now I, I love reading um and uh that also ties into something that fa hayek uh writes about in uh, i think it was the road to serfdom mm-hmm. um but basically he talks about how technology is is amoral mm-hmm. um it, it can be used for good or it can be used for bad things so the crux of it is that when a new technology a, a powerful technology is developed it's all going to come down to which side if we if we you know want to generalize it which side is it the state or is it the people the individual that learns how to harness that power first Mm -hmm. and if it's the state we're all kind of screwed yes at least until the next technological advancement um so in that same way yeah with uh the expanse um if you've read the red rising series Mm. highly recommend it incredible series down too oh yeah uh so you have this mix right now. I'm reading um, Galaxy's Edge. Uh, it's kind of like Star Wars without the space magic. Yeah, um, but really, God. really good series. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> so not not a but but a lot of these a lot of these sci-fi stories break down a lot of these these political these philosophical questions inside of a different model, mm-hmm. right? In this in this sci-fi model. So with something like The Expanse. Uh, you have this development of of new governments and new societies, and especially with the OPA, as you were talking about, uh, they they see the the capacity for, you know, plowing their own field, as it were, or or going out into space and having these illegal mining mm-hmm. operations. But they're willing to take the risk because they just want to be free. They just want to run their own lives. Mm-hmm. Um, on the opposite end of that, so Red Rising is a lot more dystopian, mm. um, and not to not to give anything away, but basically society, and it's literally called the society, mm. uh, is built around a a forced caste system. So you are born as a a color. So mm. you're a red, you're a gray, you're a pink, and depending on what you were born as, uh, you are genetically altered to fit a certain role. Oh, wow. So if you're a red, you're essentially a slave. Mm. Um, if you're a pink, you're, you're forced into prostitution, um, you know, and, and your body is forced into such a way that you're built for whatever your role is. Wow. Um, 
and then golds are at the top and they're just these like greek god type <laughs> type people through through genetic splicing um and so you know it's like oh yeah you know that's that's terrifying but then you look at stuff like um crispr if you're familiar mm-hmm. with crispr um dude we're not that far away no. with we, we, the, the technology exists so then it only comes down to who harnesses it first exactly so uh what's really interesting pierce brown the the author of the red rising series uh he loves to drop little um Easter eggs, if you will, throughout all of his books. So, for example, the the head of the society is called the Sovereign, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I just read Thomas Hobbes. I see what you're doing. Nice, you know. And he, and he loves dropping things like that in there. A lot of Greek and um, Greek and Roman philosophy as well. Uh, and so I looked him up. Turns out he was a double major in political science and economics. There you go. And and he also happens to be a hell of a writer. So, yeah, I, I think sci-fi is a fantastic way of looking at different uh, models for how society may develop in the future. Mm-hmm. And, and if we can take that and then also accept that technology is not very far away, nope. we, we can put those two things together and take sci-fi far more seriously than a lot of people do, which I think is something we absolutely have to do. Yes, um, we do have to. And like you're saying, and I think it might not even be just the people in the state. I think it's going to be different levels of wealth, and that's going to create an even more massive separation. Because look at Neuralink. Mm. Uh, look at what Elon Musk's working on. That's not going to be a person like me yeah. getting that first. It's going to be people who can pay for it getting it first. Mm. And they're going to have then instant access right. to the entire whatever right in their head. Not even their fingertips anymore, their head. That kind of thing. And it's going it, to, they're going to be new humans. It's transhumanist. It's going to be a new fucking thing. And everybody else is going to get left behind who can't afford it. And now I have different issues with, I don't, I don't have obviously the eat the rich kind of thing going on, but I do not think that people sure. m- making billions of dollars uh, by the hand of government with lobbying and all of that kind of stuff, uh, being right. in bed with government is right. But though that's the stuff. Those are the that's the class, I guess, that's going to have this first. And I think it's going to create an even more mm-hmm. massive separation uh, to where we could see something like Elysium, that fucking movie. I don't know if it was a book. I hope it was a book because the movie yeah. wasn't that good. But an Elysium separation kind of thing. Oh, the movie sucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the fair point, man. Um, especially with the combination of, of, of government handouts of grants and, mm-hmm. and lobbying and whatever else. Uh, man, I just had, I had a thought about it and then I lost it. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it's not just the people or the individual in government. I think this comes back to the state of nature or, or human nature mm. in the first place. So we know that even across all of this time and across all of these technological developments and everything else, human nature is going to remain the same. Um, so yeah, the, the haves are going to get that technology first. The haves are going to use that to advance their own agendas as much as they can. That's what I was going to get at. Mm. So the flip side of that is this Aristotelian uh, viewpoint that democracy is the weakest form of government, which mm. is really funny to me. Um, so he talks about uh, monarchy, dictatorship, and democracy. And he says democracy is actually the worst form because inevitably – the have nots, whether they're right or wrong, morally, or however you want to frame it, they will use the power of the government, because that's the the strongest power that they have the power of that vote. So once they once they learn that, oh, all of the rich people have Neuralinks, and they're they're doing they're using it to, to become even more wealthy to accrue even more power, we want that too. we'll just vote for nationalized Neuralink care, or whatever, everybody gets a Neuralink. Um, and so then the question is, which is the greater evil, you know, which is, which is, um, and, you know, throw, throw the Witcher quote at me. That's fine. Um, (laughs) but which, which has the worst outcome? Uh, and this is something else that Dr. Soul, uh, is, is fundamentally correct. I think is he says, there are no such things as trade, uh, excuse excuse me. There are no such things as solutions. There are only trade-offs. So there's no there's no perfect world where 
you know, we snap our fingers and something turns out exactly the way we want it to. We're always sacrificing something else in order to achieve that. And if the, the cost is greater than the benefit, then that's a mistake, right? So what's the, what's the worst outcome that we have uh, the wealthy that, you know, use these, use these emerging technologies to accrue more wealth and power or that the people demand from the government that everybody get it. Right. You know, it's because that opens all kinds of other doors. And, and this is why it's, it's so complex, but I love kind of wrestling with these, with these sorts of ideas. I don't think the outcome would be that terribly different. Um, because if you look at, mm. yeah, I don't think, and I'm, woefully ignorant uh on i've just touched the surface but it seems to me that socialized health care is not as good as private health care um if you have across the board health care provided by the government it's not as good as if you could buy what you wanted yourself and therefore i think the Neuralink that you got if it was a universal Neuralinks, would not be as good as the ones that <laughs> people could spend more money on so i think there would still be well, a gap not. It might it might close the gap a little bit, but I think there would still be a big gap and a big class difference there. Um, this is something I've been forgetting to bring up every time you talk about human nature. I don't know yeah. that we have a nature. I think by nature okay. humans are programmable, and I think that's really that's yeah. what is the the that's why the cycle keeps going. Go back to the hunter gatherer, the idea of modeling your culture in a, in a certain way and keeping it that way. That's the programming that's going in. And right now the programming is build up as big as you can, government money, all this shit, and then it fucking collapses again over and over and over because we right. haven't broken that programming. I don't think that anybody is naturally good, bad. Um, any normal person is. I don't think psychopaths, sociopaths are. I think it's more of a mutation than a normal human. So that's... Okay the wrench that gets thrown in there with human nature, but I think it's programmable. And I think that that can be backed up by the idea that politics are downstream of culture. It's all programming and whether or not mm. it's healthy programming is up to you to figure out and the people you surround yourself with and a greater and greater scale community mm -hmm. and whatnot. That's really interesting. Um, so you're more of the, I can't remember the Latin term for it, but basically blank slate mm -hmm. is the idea. So each individual starts out as a blank slate, uh, you know, nature versus nurture aside, but then they are, they're programmed by the culture is what you're saying. I think so. Culture or, um, yeah, because culture can break down to a small level as well. Big, small level, whatever. Yeah, I think so. Sure. I, th I mean, we're, we were a stomach before we had a brain and we evolved a brain to make <laughs> it easier to <laughs> fill the stomach. <laughs> like this, that's built mm. in. That's the stuff that's never <laughs> going to change. A great analogy. And when you get to the point where <laughs> you're questioning existence and your stomach's still rumbling, <laughs> it's, you're all fucked up right. and it's the programming there. You know, it's, it's why, why am I fucked uh -huh. up? Even that question, why the stomach doesn't give a fuck why, but these are all things that have come about right. from being too efficient at filling up that stomach. And now it's something we have to mm. deal with. And programming is a thing we have to deal with. And we're not, that's the thing too. We're not, I don't, I don't know. I hate saying we, cause I can only speak for myself and I know that I'm doing better mm. at it now. I'm not, I had for a long time, wasn't programming myself. Well, I wasn't questioning. I wasn't doing, mm. uh, making the, the right, uh, what's it called? The right, Forming the right grooves through the rock, I guess. Getting that erosion, mm. that wearing in on those good habits and whatnot. And most people don't think about that. If you if you look at it, mm. it maybe it is a programming to think about your more base self. Uh, your, and it's even outside of just eating and whatnot. But what satisfies me right now? I think uh, mm. back to, <laughs> back to uh, Cardi B and all those fucking people being praised for the shit that they do. <laughs> it's because it satisfies something in that moment, sexual, entertainment, right. whatever. And it's like, well, that doesn't mm -hmm. really mean anything. That's not doing anything mm -hmm. for you. Um, and that's the programming that people have to break out of if we want something different. Otherwise, we'll continue the cycle. That was pretty rambling, but I think I right. brought it back pretty well. I'm proud no. of that. <laughs> no, you did. So that, that's actually, interestingly, a, a Rousseauian viewpoint to a certain extent. So mm -hmm. obviously not the whole, 
you know, the whole kit and caboodle where we get to, we have to destroy everything and, and behead all of the aristocracy. Um, but, but his idea on human nature was that uh, in a state of nature, we are, he, he would say perfect. So this is where you get this idea of the noble savage and everything mm. else. Um, Francis Bacon, I think, was the actual one that coined the term noble savage. But Rousseau uh, followed along that same stream as far as the state of nature is concerned. So in a state of nature, human beings are born with this blank slate, as you say. And what Rousseau argues is that as society develops, as it builds up, uh, we are distracted from that state of nature. So programming, essentially. Mm. So once we learn how to fill our stomachs efficiently, as you say, that yeah, you're, you're right in line with this. Uh, as we learn how to fill our stomachs, we have more time on our hands. So now we develop religion, we develop music, art. Uh, we, we think about the, the bigger things. And then at the same time, we're continuing to become more and more efficient at uh, uh, feeding ourselves, at, at procreating, at all of these different things, um, and, and keeping the children alive after the fact. And, and that allows us even more time to consider all of these other things. And so he says, Rousseau says that culture pulls us out of that state of nature, and that is a bad thing. Hmm. And that's where I'm, I'm like, nope gonna you know gonna, gonna split from Rousseau at that point um and so that's why he says you know when it comes down to it, it, it when society is so corrupt we have to start completely over from scratch hmm. and rebuild it from there um I don't disagree entirely with the notion of co sort of having too much time on our hands and developing all of these different things I think it's a double-edged sword so we can come up with things that are destructive to one another and to ourselves. We can also come up with great things that end up benefiting tons and tons of people. I think uh, Thomas Hobbes was more correct in, in saying that uh, it, it, essentially the inverse of Rousseauianism. So in a state of nature, we are not perfect. We are, we are violent, short, brutish, um, distrustful, and society pulls us out of that, hmm. and that's a good thing, right? So just my, my opinion being that we are basically, evil's a bit of a strong word, hmm. but we are, as, as Hobbes says we are, we are, we are violent, distrustful, brutish. Because uh, let's be honest, if you and I were both dropped into the forest uh, and we're, you know, we have no tools, Maybe we're, you know, it's like a naked and afraid kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've never met you before in my entire life. I have no idea what your beliefs are. And I see you. My initial thought's going to be, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what his intentions are. I'm probably not going to walk out of the forest and shake your hand and say, hey, man, let's figure out how to build a house. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'll probably watch you for a while and mm -hmm. be like, what's this guy about? You know, if, if I see you doing something that I don't like, you know, maybe you like, torture an animal or something. I'm mm. going to be like, no, I really don't like this guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that, you know, that, that leads into uh, the Habesian view of human nature. And, and that's why, at least for me, imagining myself in that kind of scenario, I, I know how I would act. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any reason for it to be any different with other people. Um, but it's an interesting, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a, mental exercise either way. And that's why I love having these kinds of conversations. Um, go ahead. I, I guess I'm, that's I, oh, I read, yeah. my ramble. Good. I just think that might be a cultural invention. That idea that when you see somebody, you don't know you're, you're standoffish. Um, and that goes back to mm -hmm. something I, I'm sure it was a podcast I listened to on hunter gatherers and uh, a theory of how tribalism formed and why, and why there was so much yeah. conflict when tribes met each other, whether it was mm. um, tribes that had territory or nomadic tribes. And one of the theories is mm. that it wasn't that they just didn't like each other because they had a different tribe culture or anything like that. But when people that didn't mm. interact regularly came across each other, they had different uh germ biomes and diseases and stuff like that and they would interact and then uh, oh shit everybody would get sick and back then it's like fuck we got demons from them you know this shit's bad and so then anytime right. they saw anybody yeah. 
come near, they'd be like, no, 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 get the fuck away. We're not doing this shit again. Stay the fuck away. And they'll keep them away with extreme prejudice. I thought that was extremely interesting as far mm-hmm. as how that may have formed. That's very interesting. Because, yeah, if you didn't like if if we were to throw ourselves into that situation, but without, I guess, everything that we've had I, that who knows how long that idea has been around hundreds of thousands of years and whatnot. I mm-hmm. guess you throw yourself into that situation and say we're both vaccinated and we don't have to worry about that kind of thing. We don't have to worry about all that uh, ingrained mm-hmm. shit. Then it would make sense. You're like, oh, fuck, there's somebody else that looks like me. There's another animal that looks like me out here, another person versus the fucking tiger mm-hmm. or wherever we're at trying to kill me and snakes and shit. Dude, we need to squat up. We need to take care, yeah. take care of this shit so we don't get eaten by these fucking tigers. That's a possibility. Yeah. But no, that, that, I think that's a fair point. I, I think that's a fair point. Um, so part of part of the, I guess, one of these theories of of tribes forming and and people grouping together is they did eventually see the mutual benefit of trade or of defense mm-hmm. or of you know what have you. It increases their chances of survival and procreation, which are the two primary drives of human beings. So. Uh, this is something else that Hayek writes about in The Fatal Conceit, which I thought was very interesting, is if you've got uh, multiple societies or, or uh, group, groups of people, you know, so let's say we've got City A and City B, right? And then City A has got wheat and City B has grapes, mm-hmm. you know, and they want a little variety in their diet. So they're going to trek across all of that land and overcome all of these obstacles and everything else in order to get what they want. And then eventually somebody figures out, hey, why don't I, I settle an area in between the two in, on this major trade route and I'm going to make a ton of money? And then that creates a third city, mm. you know, and then all of this development continues. Um, and again, it's, it's, uh, he akins it to a, a survival of the fittest as far as human behavior is concerned. So, and that's going to turn out differently. And I think that's a major part of why cultures develop in different ways is that what works for us in uh, the U S isn't going to be, uh, isn't going to stem from the same behavioral patterns that were most efficient in say central Asia or whatever else. So uh, I'm going to reference guns, germs, and steel. Mm. And I know there is a lot of controversy about uh, a lot of the points he makes. So Jared diamond is a, is a biologist by, by trade, by career not an anthropologist, uh, not a historian, but he throws out a lot of ideas that are, I think are at least interesting enough to consider. So one of the things he talks about is how culture develops based on the natural resources, uh, the climate, even the geography mm-hmm. uh, of, of a land. And so as, again, you have the survival of the fittest as far as human behavioral patterns are concerned. So, and then that in turn forms a culture, uh, forms tradition, forms all of these different things. And then that will cause friction between different groups that have different traditions, different cultures. So uh, there's a historical concept. I can't remember what it's called, but basically the idea is that whenever two differing groups meet for the first time, they are most likely to fight one another first. Mm. And then they kind of get over that, and then they start this this enmeshing of the two groups of uh, culture, of tradition, of of you know whether even even if it's like clothing styles. Well, hey, those guys they wear man dresses, but <laughs> it's really really hot outside. So I think it looks funny, but maybe there's a good reason for them to be wearing sure. that. I'm gonna try it too, you know. And oh, well, that works way better than what I was doing before. Um, I, I lost my point here, but I think it's just really interesting to consider all of these different things. So there's another book called Ghost Wars uh, that is basically a, a cultural um, and historical look at the war in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And this came out it's probably a decade ago, but uh, basically juxtaposing American culture, American society, how it has formed with uh, Afghan, Afghan society, Afghan culture, and everything else. And one of the things that I found most interesting about it, this is where the geography comes into play and kind of uh, uh, intersects with Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, 
is they talk about how Kabul and Kandahar, uh, the two biggest cities in the country, are, are, you know, very centralized and everything else. But it's also because they're on planes, you know. Uh, it's easier to settle. It's, be- it's easier to grow crops and everything else. But then most of the rest of the country is split into these valleys surrounded by high ridges. Mm. And there are tons and tons of examples of a village in one valley and a village in another valley. And these people have never interacted, even though these villages right. are thousands of years old. They have never interacted, even to the point where some of them develop completely different uh, dialects linguistically um, and, and totally separate from one another, even though they're just several miles away. So this lends to this concept of when you get into nation building, this idea of nation building in Afghanistan, it's, it's nigh impossible. Mm. And when I was in the military and we did these briefings and, and had to you know, learn a little bit about the culture before we deployed there, they actually talked about that, how their culture is tribal first. Mm. So it's the tribe, in order of priority, it's the tribe, the clan, well, family, tribe, clan, uh, region, and then nation. Yeah. Whereas in the U.S., it's more like family nation, right? right? So if you can't unify, you can't unify a people like that around a flag, around a nation, purely based on geography. Mm. That is amazing. To it me. is. Um, but it makes total sense. And it's like, how do, how do we, in terms of geopolitics and international relations and everything else, how do we overcome those, those barriers or those obstacles? Mm. Um, like I said, I'm going on a bit of a rant here, but just a lot to think about. I don't know. That kind of sounds better to me, that <laughs> that kind of breakdown. Hmm. Not necessarily because sure. of uh, geography, but back to what we were saying about the different political zones. Um, but I do like that hmm. hierarchy of values much better than family hmm. state. I think that's uh, that's right. where I would like to build off of is, is going from that. Um but yeah, man, we've we've blown way past my my recording time, but I just let it ride because I've had a great time. I hope I'm not keeping you from stuff because I still want to get yeah. that Patreon video out of you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. I'd love to. Um, yeah, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. This has been a great conversation. Hopefully you're open to doing it again. Absolutely. I'm definitely down to doing it again. Um, I'm going to be doing a rebrand. I've been mentioning that kind of getting away from the in your face meme fucking theme and anarchist stuff and try to branch <laughs> out for more conversations like this with people outside of my echo chamber because look how fucking good it turned out so yeah that's that's the next step but yeah i'll bring you back on when i get rebranded uh because you've been a great guest it's a fucking awesome conversation definitely gonna need to do it again um go yeah. ahead and plug your projects before we go sure uh so i'm the multimedia director at think liberty uh you can find us on Facebook at Think Liberty. Our website is think-liberty.com. Um, I also host the Liberty Bites podcast. It's a short form, uh, short form podcast every Monday at eight o'clock. Uh, we, I've moved into doing live streams on Facebook every every Monday at eight o'clock at night, uh, Eastern time. Mm. So uh, that's what I'm working on right now. And then of course my second one is Drink Liberty, as you see here, uh, and it's more of a long form uh, where I generally do what, what we've done today. I'll have somebody on, we're going to talk about a topic, just kind of BS a little bit. And if we get off track, that's okay. Mm. And you know, we, we get drunk while we're doing it. So it's, it's a good time. Um, that's what I'm working on right now, man. Uh, so if, if y'all have liked what we've talked about, there's more to be seen on the, uh, the think Liberty Facebook page. Awesome. And uh, of course, if any, anybody, any members of your audience are interested in starting a podcast of their own, please look me up. Uh, I'm on Facebook at William Gadsden. Uh, and my my page is William Gaston, political commentator. So if anyone is interested in starting a podcast, I love giving people some tips, giving them equipment lists, whatever else. So they need to get started. And if you end up joining the Think Liberty podcast network, hey, that's good, too. But no pressure on that. I just love seeing people pursue their goals in the name of liberty. Awesome. Great fucking stuff. Thanks for coming on, man. I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. I don't yeah. even need to hope that they enjoyed it. I'm sure they did. That was amazing. Uh, now we're going <laughs> to jump into the after hours. So if you're a patron, you can go and or if you're not a patron and you want to see the after hours, you can go to patreon.com slash the dank pod stash or Bitbacker, which no one's done yet. Give me your fucking crypto. 
But uh, if not, that's cool too. Um, like, subscribe, share, love all that stuff. And remember, everybody, total freedom, no exceptions. Enemy of the State's Dank Podstash is sponsored by Project Sparta. Go to ProjectSpartaCoaching.com to learn more. I'm in